Hello and welcome to a very special video edition of PC Gamers Hardware section. We're here on what's possibly the hottest day of the year in the only unair conditioned building in PC Gamer Towers to show you how to do something that we bang on about every month in the magazine, and that's build the PC Gamer rig. We've sourced all of our components online, so we've saved ourselves a lot of money over buying off the shelf, and the only thing we're going to need to put them together is a screwdriver and a fair amount of patience. It's really simple. I'm going to bang through it quite quickly. It might take you a bit longer, probably up to about four or five hours, in fact, if this is your first uh, attempt at building a PC. But uh, just bear with us, pause the video if you need to take a break, uh, come back to it later on, have a cup of tea, unwind, uh, just have fun. The first thing we're going to do is put as many components as possible into the motherboard before we put the motherboard into the PC case. The reason for that is fairly obvious. There's not a lot of room in the case and once you've screwed the motherboard down it's quite easy to catch your finger on sharp metal edges for the hard drive cages or shove a screwdriver through a PCB accidentally, something like that. So we're going to put together things like the CPU, the memory, the heatsink and uh, stick them all into the board before we actually put the board into the case. Um, the motherboard itself we've taken out of its box and I'm resting it on something soft. Uh, a piece of foam is quite good, the box that it came in is almost as good. Uh, what we don't want to do is put it directly onto the table because as you can see on the bottom there's lots of solder um, which is quite easy to break off if you start forcing components in whilst it's on a hard surface. Um, we're going to start off by putting the CPU into the socket. Um, that's the CPU, that's the CPU socket. There are uh, several different types of CPU socket. Uh, the two biggest distinctions are between AMD and Intel, of course. Intel CPUs come with a flat base like that, and you can see all of these little gold pin connectors on the bottom. Uh, that's each one of those makes a tiny circuit with the motherboard itself. And inside the socket, you can see there are pins sticking up which connect with the gold connectors. Uh, AMD processors and motherboards do that the other way around. The processors have uh, hundreds and hundreds of tiny pins on the bottom and the motherboard socket has a lot of holes in it. Um, one of the reasons it's easier to build an Intel system as your first PC is because it's very hard to break that. Uh, an AMD processor with lots of pins on the bottom breaks very easily. So that's the different types of CPU covered. The big question is, how do you attach it to the motherboard? Well, it's fairly straightforward, actually. The socket itself is known as a ZIF socket. Uh, that stands for zero insertion force. Fairly self-explanatory. It means you don't need to put any pressure at all on the CPU to put it into the socket. The reason you don't want to put any pressure on it is because you don't want to break these gold pins. That would be a very expensive mistake to make. Basically, the whole motherboard would have to be replaced. On a uh, AMD processor, of course, you break the pins, you have to buy a new processor. To put the CPU into the socket, it's a bit like a, giant, uh, like a tiny jigsaw puzzle. You see these two little notches on either side of the CPU there. They line up with the shape of the socket here. There are two little uh, plastic sticky out bits there. The CPU sits on top of the pins lined up with those. You simply close the metal cover and then pull back the retention arm. That slots under there and you're done. When the PC is switched on, the CPU is going to get very hot. Uh, now the problem is that when processors run hot, they run slow and eventually break. So we want to draw the heat away from the silicon inside the processor and disperse it into the air inside the case where the fans will blow it out the back. Uh, we do this using a device called a heat sink. Uh, this simply sits on top of the processor and draws the heat away through the CPU block here, uh, up through a set of pipes and into a radiator array on the top where a large fan cools it. It's all fairly straightforward. The only problem is uh, that where the plate on the bottom of the heatsink touches the plate on the top of the CPU, it doesn't make a perfect join. Um, there are tiny pockets of air in the grain of the metal which can slow up the transfer of heat from one to the other. So what we're going to do is put a layer of liquid metal between the two because that spreads out and fills in all those gaps, making the join more conductive. Usually, uh, when you buy a new heat sink, there's a small layer of this liquid metal, which we call thermal paste, already applied to the base. Uh, we haven't got that on this one because we've been putting it on and off of uh, CPUs for a few weeks now. Uh, so we're going to apply a thin layer of thermal paste from a tube like this. Well, kind of like this. This is how you buy it in the shops. Uh, however, because we need to make the layer very thin, we're going to be using a slightly more expensive type of thermal paste. Uh, which we can apply with a brush. Uh, this is even more liquid, 
and just simply paints onto the top of the CPU. Now the trick to applying thermal paste is that you need to get a very thin layer that covers the whole of the top of the CPU, but you don't want to make it too thick, otherwise you'll trap heat underneath the paste and the CPU will overheat. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. Some people say put a blob in the middle and squidge it down with the heat sink itself. When you're applying it with a brush though, it's very easy. You simply paint on a thin layer like this. So we're starting from the edges with this, but it doesn't really matter too much. Um, just try not to get it on the motherboard if you can. And simply paint it on in your best draw Paris style. So you've got a nice thin layer that covers the whole top of the metal CPU like this. Once we've put the uh, thermal paste onto the CPU, now we need to attach the heatsink. There are two different ways of attaching heat sinks. AMD heat sinks have a metal retention clip. Intel ones tend to use these plastic pins. They simply line up with holes that are around the CPU socket and push through to lock into position like that. Now what they don't tell you is that the pins swing through a 90 degree angle locking and if you look very carefully you can see there's a little arrow on the top here. Uh, it's sort of counterintuitive. When the pin's turned in the direction against the arrow, uh, it's locked. When it's turned in the direction of the arrow, it's unlocked, and you can pull it out of the motherboard. And just like putting the CPU into the socket, it's actually very hard to get this wrong. Uh, there are four holes, there are four pins, so we put the heat sink down gently, line the pins up with the holes, and just push them in there so they're just in the right position. And once they're all in the right place, one at a time, push them in to lock them down. It's best to do this working in opposite angles, just because that means you get a nice even spread of force over the top of the CPU for spreading the heat sink, the heat, the thermal paste. And finally, there's the power supply for the fan, and that matches this little set of jumpers here on the motherboard that's helpfully, mar helpfully marked CPU fan. The last thing we're going to do before we put the motherboard into the case is fit the RAM. Now, just like with the heatsink, just like with the CPU, it's actually very hard to get this wrong. So long as you've got the right type of RAM for your motherboard, and this is a DDR2-based motherboard, so we're using uh, DDR2 RAM, uh, you'll find that there's a little notch in the bottom of the component which matches exactly the shape of the socket on the board. You simply make sure everything's in the right place, and then gently push down till it locks in. Uh, you're going to need at least two sticks of RAM, and what you'll often find is that the different sockets are all colour-coded, and in this case we need to fill the yellow ones first, but exactly how your motherboard works will be in the manual. So there we've got the motherboard, the CPU, the heat sink and the RAM all assembled over here and over here we've got the case. Now obviously we want to put the one into the other and the easiest way to do that is to start off by lying the case flat on its back. You'll probably want to do this on a soft surface so that you don't scratch the back of the case and once it's down just pull all the wires out of the way so that you've got a nice clear area to work in inside. Now the one thing you will notice is that underneath the exhaust fan here there's a large hole and that's where all of the external connectors on the motherboard are going to poke through. Now, motherboards all come with what's known as an RF shield. Uh, that's cut specially to fit into that gap. And that just pushes in and locks. And it does serve a purpose. It's designed to prevent radio interference from affecting the components around the connectors. Most motherboards these days probably don't even need it. Once the RF shield's in place, um, the only thing you need to check before you put the motherboard in is that these brass risers are all in place. Now, they will match up with a series of holes in the motherboard. Uh, the screws that hold the motherboard down go and fit into those. And what they do is they just lift the PCB up off the back of the case so that it's not shorting out metal or metal contacts anywhere and damaging components. The motherboard itself, once all that's done, simply drops in. And you just line everything up with the RF shield and the screws.